I'm a photographer and after 12 years of working all over the world, I now live here alone in India. I'm single. I'm a freelance news and features photographer, so I'm self-employed, which means I don't have a boss, but it also means I don't know where my next paycheck's coming from and I have absolutely no routine. <laughs> A little bit of background about myself. I was born and bred in London, and in 1981, at the age of 14, my dad gave me my first camera. And then I went on to do a degree in photography at Nottingham Polytechnic. After that, I got my first big break, which was freelancing for the Telegraph newspaper in London. And I was incredibly green, and I had an awful lot to learn. <laughs> Everyone goes into journalism and works for a national newspaper with the idea that you're going to be working on great stories, um, world-breaking, shattering news stories. And uh, in fact, those are very, very few and far between. And most of the jobs that a person does is what we call fluffy stories. Unfortunately for Karen, she's brilliant at those soft, fluffy pictures. In 1992, I graduated from Fluffy's and I took myself off on my first overseas assignment to Albania. It was the end of the Hodja regime and I photographed that and the forgotten orphanages. It was very harrowing but very exciting all at the same time. After that came months and months covering the troubles in Northern Ireland. Karen is very good at working with writers. It can be hard in Northern Ireland to find a new shot. I remember one that she took that I was very impressed with. Orange men in bowler hats silhouetted against sky that was glowing orange. It had a sense of menace about it and that was what you tended to feel there. a great place to cover South Asia from, but my next assignments are in Pakistan, where I used to live. Back in 99, General Pervez Musharraf took control of the country in a military coup. All of the newspapers and magazines were screaming for shots of this dictator with his finger on the button of the Islamic world's first nuclear bomb. But what happened was after an awful lot of hustling, I finally got to see the general, and he wasn't planning World War III. He was playing with his puppies. The shot was very controversial in Pakistan, and it made headlines all over the world. The cuddly coup, my first scoop. Anyway, now I'm going back to try and get an up-to-date picture of the man himself. To get an appointment with General Musharraf, now the President of Pakistan, is no easy matter. The main problem is access. I'm hoping we'll get this meeting. I think it should be OK. I'm an optimist and um, I'm also a very good phone basher. So. <laughs> oh, welcome, Salam. Could I speak to Mr Abbasi, please? First, I have to reach an elusive government official called Mr Abbasi. And without his agreement, I'm not going to get my appointment. OK, he's, he's busy in a meeting, and I should ring back after 20 minutes. Oh, oh, hello, it's Karen Davis speaking. OK, that's lovely. I'll, I'll call you back in five minutes. He's not in his office? Call back in 15 minutes. I can see that contacting Mr Abbasi is going to be an ongoing challenge. But I've got another assignment. I've got very involved in a story that's brought me back to Pakistan again and again in recent months.
That's nice. Yes. <laughs> Jemima Khan is a UNICEF representative, a That's fashion good. designer That's and an international so celebrity. That's a very good That's picture. Her father That's was one of Europe's good. most successful business tycoons, and she's married to one of Pakistan's greatest sporting heroes, the cricketer and politician Imran Khan. In Europe and Australia, newspapers and magazines can't get enough of her. I don't know, it depends what happens. I don't know if the money will keep coming in. Mm. Between over the next few weeks, I mean, so far it hasn't stopped coming in, yeah. and we're getting money now. Over the last few months, I've been taking pictures for her appeal for Afghan refugees in northern Pakistan. I find that much more touching image, yeah. for example, because look, she look at her face. Yeah. Go, go back one. It's going to So far, more than a hundred thousand dollars has been donated as a result of stories in the British press. And you know the baby they brought me, and they yeah. said this baby, the mother can't feed it. Yes. She's got no milk, or she's too ill to feed yes, the baby. Yes, yes. That baby died as well. No. Yeah, there's been a lot of death since we've been there. That's why it's really important to go tomorrow. So it's back to the refugee camp, my third trip in two months. I'm not trying to look like a Sicilian widow. The fact is that I'm now in one of Pakistan's most conservative areas, and all of us women, at the very least, have to wear a dupatta or headscarf. They're hot and incredibly difficult to work in. This is Jalazai. It's home to an estimated 80,000 refugees who've come over land from Afghanistan, escaping war, drought, and desperate poverty. <laughs> But you know, we need, there's more children. We need to take them down there because they're not getting any. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Can we not get rid of the men here and let the women come and choose? Because the women aren't going here because of the men. Why do we get the women up to come and choose what they want? The urgent goal is to replace the pathetic plastic shelters that many of these families have been living in. The conditions, as you can see, are absolutely appalling, and this child here looks in a pretty bad way. The heat, it's probably about 45 degrees now. All those children all asking for food. You know, we have to be fair in the system. Everyone's got to get a shelter yeah. before some people have shelter and food and some people have nothing. Jemima's appeal has raised money to buy proper tents, and today they're being distributed. Yeah. 14,000 pounds I've just given Mariam in cash yesterday. Yeah. That's for this lot. The mood here is really sort of one of desperation. I mean, can you imagine having absolutely nothing and then getting the opportunity to get something? You are going to fight for it, aren't you? You're not going to be at the back of the queue. Jemima is passionate about these people. It's been a revelation working with her, watching her use her celebrity status to raise awareness and money. And for me personally, it's great to give something back. From previous trips, I've sold my photographs for over $10,000, which I've given to the Appeal Fund. I'm hoping today's work will raise even more. Oh, I, careful, careful of this child. No, no, this is hers. This is hers. This is hers. Oh. It's OK, it's OK, it's OK. It's OK. I spend a lot of time arriving in, in new towns and cities with my eyes peeled on either side of the road for a decent photo processing lab because I'm very old fashioned and I don't use digital cameras. Kodak Express. I can't tell you how thrilled I was when I saw this. Come to collect that film. I'm collecting the first batch from this morning's shoot. Always a nervous moment. Is it going to be blank? No, fine. OK. Good. OK. Back to the camp to get a specific shot for the London Sunday Telegraph. The readers have donated a lot of money, and we're trying to show how it's been spent, hopefully with a shot of a family that's received a new tent. 
Yeah. And we're actually only doing a, we're doing a story about one or two specific women, and at the moment there's a crowd of 25, which is going to, uh, thank you very much, <laughs> and it's about 125 degrees in here. I've got a deadline, and I'm a bit worried about this. <laughs> I always feel torn in these situations. OK, my deadline's important, but look at this woman. She's got nothing but the clothes she's wearing. Let's have a go. OK. I'll be leaving in a minute. She'll be staying here. good few hours work yet to do to get these pictures to London so um, frame 15 the pictures I'm choosing will go tonight via email to the Telegraph and Hello magazine in London and gamma my agency in Paris that's a nice picture she quite I think that's quite good let's see if this works I rely on um, good old-fashioned film I've got used to shooting on negative and so in a way my, my work's half digital. It's, it's shot on neg, scanned in and converted into digital files. No, it doesn't work. Bin it. This is just a matter of patience. Oh, this is quite good. I don't actually like cropping pictures. But in this occasion, I think I'm going to. Okay, that's nice. Now a quick call to Hello Magazine's picture desk in London. I'll be sending over another six from today. All right, my dear. Okay, bye. Bye. They don't have to go through the next stage. Emailing the pictures very very slowly but they will get them in London today even if it takes me all night so the Afghan refugee assignments over but my search for Mr Abbasi and my appointment with General Musharraf continues Ah, he's busy in a meeting. What time will he be free? After half an hour, DK. So should I give you a call back on the 14th? I'll give you a call and uh, then we'll be able to confirm that. Unfortunately, it's now scheduled for nine o'clock at okay. night in President Musharraf's right, office much, in a week's time. I just wanted to get something a little bit different, a little bit special because you know, a picture of him in his office, a talking headshot, it doesn't really do it for me. But we'll see. Something's better than nothing, I guess. Well, it's 45 degrees in the shade down in Islamabad, and I've got a few days off between assignments. So come up to the Swat Valley to fish. I, I love my job, I do, but sometimes the fixing, the phone calls, the hustling, the hassle, the politics as well, that can get to me. And, and then actually I lose focus of what I'm actually meant to be doing. And the picture becomes the least important thing. Yes. I find it like a meditation, actually. The sound, the movement of the water, I lose all thought, everything, except uh, focusing on the fishing. Right, he's going straight back into the water. The other thing is actually you feel in this awesome landscape, these huge mountains, you do feel like a dot. You realise you're sort of space and point on the planet. You're not that important, actually. <laughs> Thank you. 
Swap Valley is a long way from my childhood in England. That's me on the right, and my sister Susan's on the left. My dad was a BBC news editor, travelling the world. I suppose when I was little, I always wanted to do something like him. I worked in television news, and I was around the world in most of the wars from Vietnam right the way through to Bosnia. I had been going to um, Belfast quite regularly. Uh, this was the time of the troubles, lots of car bombs and things like that. And I didn't realize and what, how it affected her. And she sent a little note, and it was under my pillow one night, Dear Daddy, please have a good time in Belfast, but please mind the bombs. And I just, it cracked me up. I, well, I did shed a tear that night. And um, I realized I shouldn't take them for granted, as I would seemed to be doing. It was a, quite a, a lesson in looking after your children, I suppose. I remember not wanting my dad to go away so much. But I also remember being excited by him being in the thick of international news stories. I guess it's rubbed off on me. I'm now on my way back to Islamabad, but I've got caught up in a demonstration. These men want Pakistan to enforce Sharia. That's the traditional Islamic system of law. In Western terms, this interpretation of Sharia is basically Islamic fundamentalism. These blokes certainly aren't used to seeing a scruffy Western woman running around with a camera. But you never know, it might make an interesting picture. Okay, really, really uncomfortable under here. I'm so hot. Uh, feeling a little bit frustrated because I'm not sure if I got a picture that actually caught the energy of that demonstration. I was shooting sort of against the light. I, got, I think I got a, some, a portrait of one of the young guys, possibly Taliban. <laughs> it was an odd situation to be in, the only woman, but that's, that's where the camera being a barrier helps you. And you just really, just literally focus. You focus on everything that you're doing and ignore the fact that they're chanting God is great at you and um, might not want you to be there. Yeah, I do get lonely. I do. But at the same time with this job, you have, to, um, you have to be very independent. You have to be able to operate on your own. The only thing I can do is take photographs, and it's the only way I can make money. So for the moment, I haven't got any commitments. I don't have the family. I don't have uh, the kids or a relationship. So for this time, I've just got to crack on with my work and enjoy it. OK, my stars today, Libra. Take special care in traffic. <laughs> oh, that's a long way down. Vertigo. Now for my next assignment. I'm heading up into northern Pakistan for the Sunday Telegraph to cover the Shandor Polo. It happens every year, and it's the world's highest altitude polo tournament. It's been so hot and sweaty down on the plane. It's really steaming. And for the first time in months, I'm cold. It's fantastic. We drove for 12 hours yesterday. There's only 120 miles to go, but on these roads, it's going to take all day. Travel tip for the ladies. When traveling on bumpy jeep tracks in the northern areas of Pakistan, Bring a firm, supportive bra, otherwise it's agony. <laughs> Boob ache. <laughs> do the, do... <laughs> it's all of a sudden, we've just come onto this, this high plateau, green, and it's flat. And this is where they play the polo. We're on the roof of the world. Well, not quite. It'll do, though. 12,500 feet. 
वेलकम टू शंदर The Shandor Polo Tournament is probably Pakistan's most famous annual sporting event, and there's already a couple of thousand people here. Tomorrow, it's the big match. I'm a little bit worried about my feet. They're all wrinkled. They look like I've walked up to the Shandor Pass. <laughs> God, if my feet look this wrinkled, what's my face like? <laughs> I'm a little bit giggly tonight because I think it's the altitude sickness. I'm also uh, hiding the fact that I'm deeply, deeply anxious about this job, this assignment. Because we've only got time to shoot one polo match. We've come all the way up here, we've got time to shoot one match tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock. It lasts 15 minutes, so I better get it right. All this way to the roof of the world. But I'm not bugger it up. <laughs> oh, right. As usual for the newspaper, I'm looking for a single image that sums up the mood and the story. Oh, fantastic. You can't go wrong with this landscape and light. They are practicing, eh? Awesome. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> I'm actually feeling incredibly happy because these are my two favourite things, I think, on Earth, is, is horses and um, cameras. It's all very fast. Uh, I'm just shooting, blatting through the film. Something's going to work, you know. Oh, God. Ah, no! It's just kind of really filling up the frame and the film <laughs> rewound. Absolutely typical. Okay, the match is due to start. I'm just going to keep snapping away and see what happens. Women. Very unusual to see them. Hopefully as a woman photographing the woman, they won't be too upset. A lot more difficult for a man to do this. Okay, bus. Although the sport of polo is an ancient tradition in Central Asia, the first tournament was played here in Shandor on a field established by a British officer called Major Kopp. Since Major Kopp's day, it's become an annual event and it's always played between the two great rival teams of Chitral and Gilgit. Someone told me, it's not a game, it's war. First goal to Chitral. There's so much happening, I hardly know where to point my camera. Nearly got it then. Changing film. They are the bottom of the The first half has ended in an argument. Equal scores, four goals each to Chitral and Gilgit. This is one of those times when I have to pinch myself to believe that I'm actually here. People pay me to do this.
to trial of the winners, and I'm pretty happy too. It was really good fun, really good pictures in the can. Hi, is that Mr. Abassi? I was just wondering if you had uh, confirmation of uh, the appointment with the general tonight. That's fine. OK, thank you very much. It's going to happen. 8.30, pitch black. No matter how hard I nagged them, uh, the chief executive wouldn't change his schedule for me. How inconsiderate, but uh, I'm just going to have to make the most of this. I've been here to, to Army House before, and it was about five days after the coup, and I took a photograph uh, on this very porch. Somebody shoved me down, and I shot the picture like that. It's kind of framed here, I think. Okay. I'm not going to have very long to do this, so uh, I'm just going to have to take it as it comes and wing it. I don't get nervous um, when meeting sort of high profile or famous people. That doesn't make me nervous. I just get slightly anxious about actually getting a good picture. That's the only thing that makes me nervous. Something like this is sort of pretty unusual and kind of one off, and you don't want to mess it up. For example, you do want to have a roll of film in your camera. Those are two journalist friends of mine from the London Guardian newspaper, but typical, they've been here for an hour already, carrying on their interview. I believe in uh, talking straight to a person, uh, and uh, I <laughs> It's not really fair, because I need some time on my own with the president to get a decent picture. And with this crowd here, it's going to be impossible. The standing. Okay. The other thing, completely underdressed. Everyone was suited and booted. And here am I in my kind of hiking gear. God. Oh, well. Oh. It's disappointing because I really wanted to do something different and special. And it was hijacked by the hacks. <laughs> So for now, my work in Pakistan is over and I'm heading back to India. It's a long, long drive down to the border at Wagga, but it's worth it because every day, twice a day, they have the most amazing military display here. Look, there's India. Go home to Delhi. <laughs> this is possibly one of the greatest free shows on Earth um, and maybe the inspiration for Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks. People tell me they've come from miles away to see the ceremony. They say it's a big tourist attraction on both sides. There's a huge historic rivalry between Pakistan and India. In this spectacular display of national pride, both armies seem to have chosen their tallest, fiercest, and loudest soldiers for border duty. great to be back home. After three sweaty weeks on the road, here's something I've been really looking forward to. Delhi's finest beauty parlor at the Oberoi. A 
first met Karen at the beauty parlour, and she arrived from some you know horrible destination, a sort of tricky job, Kashmir um, or Afghanistan or something, looking like a creature. She, her hair was stuck to her head, and she just dropped all her her cameras and sat down, and and we started to chat, and so that's how we met. <laughs> Then she emerged looking fabulous and didn't miss a beat really, went straight on to the party scene that night. I've been in South Asia for three years now and I guess it feels like home. I meet a lot of people in this job and I've made a lot of good friends. People I catch up with between trips, people I work and travel with. We're drawn to the same kinds of, uh, of stories. We're drawn to the same uh, sort of dramatic events and, and human dramas. We went out to Bangalore to do the return of Rajkumar, this Indian film star who spent three months in the jungle. The mood when we got there was very ugly, hundreds of people on the streets. Basically, it all went horribly wrong. In those kind of few seconds, Cam was pushed into a ditch and almost very nearly kind of seriously sexually assaulted. She's so focused, she's so completely in the moment and after the photograph that perhaps she doesn't take enough care sometimes. It's tough for her to be isolated. I mean, she, I came out to Pakistan with her husband and then I now have a family there. Um, Karen's alone, more or less. It's quite a brave decision to make. She's very inspiring to have around. There's never a dull moment with Karen. I've enjoyed my last few years in India and Pakistan. My assignments have been full of colour and really rewarding. Most of the time it's been fun to work here. But my job hasn't always been quite so easy. Back in 92, I went on assignment to Mogadishu, Somalia. It was such a bad situation that after a while, I put down my cameras and signed up as a volunteer aid worker. That's me at the age of 25. And the girl behind is my friend, a nurse called Valerie Place. Less than an hour after these pictures were taken, we were on our way to a project outside Mogadishu. Valerie was shot dead in an ambush on the road. She was only 23. <laughs> she was shot through the heart. And it could quite easily have been me. And it made me very fatalistic, I think, you know, that there is one day that you can't avoid. But also made me realise that I'm not bulletproof or invincible. And when I find myself in certain situations these days, I, uh, I think of her. I often think about her. I still keep in touch with a lot of my friends from Concern, the Irish humanitarian aid agency I worked for in Somalia. They've just emailed me and I've agreed to do an assignment for them in Angola, Africa, in a couple of weeks' time. But first I'm going home to London tomorrow for a quick break. I'm looking forward to seeing my family, and especially my sister Susan, who's due to have her first baby in a couple of weeks' time. It feels great to be home amongst very familiar surroundings. You do get homesick, and when you're overseas, everything's new, but uh, coming home, all the reference points are there, familiar. You're left here. The friends, the family, the places, yeah. the language. It's great to see my sister Susan. Her baby's almost due, and I really want to be here for that. But I'm off to Angola tomorrow for a week's trip. Cheers. So, I've got one more night out in the town before I become an auntie. <laughs> oh, God, it's miles. Where are we going?
Angola was a Portuguese colony until independence in 75. Since then, there's been an on-off civil war between the government and the rebel armies of UNITA. You know, as a result of the war, this country's health statistics are, I think, the second worst in the world. Uh, and the war has disrupted any sort of health service. Mike was my boss at Concerns Operation in Somalia back in 92. Since then, he's been back and forth to Angola. Angola is about twice the size of France. This is Luanda here, and you'll be flying to Quito here. Um, the red on the map signifies the areas which are safe. By definition, the areas which are white are unsafe. There is a tiny enclave where you will be landing which is regarded as safe. It will take an hour and 40 minutes to fly there. You'll arrive overhead Quito at about 27,000 feet, and then the plane will start to spiral down. This is Ooh. to offset the uh, threat from uh, surface-to-air missiles, right. uh, one of which was fired recently at a WFP plane. to 10 World Food Programme planes are coming in here every day, loaded with maize, oil and beans. Without this aid, something like 100,000 people could be starving. <laughs> 30,000 people are reckoned to have died in a largely unreported siege here in 93. That's three times the number that died in the siege of Sarajevo, which was dominating the headlines at around the same time. People say the last serious fighting here was in 99. Whoa, very good. <laughs> I think that some photographers think that photographing the children is an easy option. And I guess it is in that they aren't going to arrest you. But. I always think that their faces tell quite a lot, their eyes do. I'm just pondering and questioning and wondering what sort of photographs I'm going to get tomorrow, uh, considering I've got one day to shoot. And I'm finding it a little bit difficult to actually get a grip of what's going on here. And I've got a very wide brief from Concern, and um, rather earnestly, that's to tell the truth, and that's just not so simple. For my pictures, I have three concerned projects to look at. A rural rehabilitation program distributing grain and seeds, a feeding centre for starving mothers and children, and a programme for landmine victims. I think aid agencies, news organisations are now aware that people have seen this stuff so many times from Africa. It doesn't necessarily work. It doesn't necessarily make people put their hand in the pocket. Oh, having a real temper tantrum. Just because he's naked, covered in dust, and an African, doesn't mean that he's necessarily suffering. 
with a clever caption, it would be um, read in a very different way. Oh, go away, too. And that's, I question that, I question that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, um, good photojournalism has to have a um, split second of truth in it. You get to the point of how true is any photograph, because what you're doing is you're isolating a situation in a split second. You're taking it out of context. There's no sound for a start. You can't see what's happened on the right side of the frame or the left side of the frame behind the photographer. So there is that question, how true is, is an image? One thing is for certain, even after all they've been through, people are amazingly resilient here. They say that Quito has one of the highest ratios of landmine victims per capita that you can find anywhere in the world. Rosita is 27 years old. When she was 11, she went to the fields with her mother and sister. We never knew that there were landmines in the field. Then the bomb exploded. My sister and I fell down. Rosita was in hospital for five months. She lost both legs and one arm. But I'm in good health now. And she's very stylish. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sitting with Rosita, I'm finding that her disabilities just disappear. To be honest, her quiet dignity puts my earlier worries about what does and doesn't make a real photograph into perspective. But it's all so wrong, and I just can't help getting angry. Who are the individuals who design these mines? Because they're people of, of obviously great expertise. But I really wonder how on earth that person can go home and sleep at night. I'd love for that person or those people, those manufacturers, the distributors of those weapons to actually come to a civilian city, to a town and see what they do. See a little boy like George. George is 10 years old and he lost his leg to a landmine about a year ago. He was fleeing from a UNITA attack when it happened. Oh, oh no, George, it's stuck. Can't get it off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, pop. Yeah. He doesn't seem to have any parents. He's on his own. I wonder if a picture of George might be the answer to my assignment. Back to work. Sometimes, rarely, you put the film in and very quickly on a roll of film you've got it and you know. I just hope for the best for his future. God knows what happened to him. The other thing about doing this work is that you're in and out so quickly and you take your pictures and then you're gone and everybody else has to stay. I wish that little George could see this. I saw the people in Quito as having extraordinary resilience, and I hope the picture shows something of that. I just didn't see them as victims. Yeah, I adore children, absolutely adore them. I mean, I'm 33, I'm not married, 
I haven't got children that I would love. And if there's anything now in the future, that's what I crave, is to have a family. And maybe to settle down, although I do suffer from terminal itchy feet. You're so new, aren't you? Oh, oh, so oh, ticklish. Are you happy? Yeah. <laughs> this job is full of highs and lows. It's very unpredictable. You don't know where you're going to be from one minute to the next. I've been getting a lot of phone calls because all of a sudden the world's changed and General Musharraf and Afghan refugees are firmly in the world's headlines. In this job, you've got to run towards the danger and I've got to make some decisions about that, big decisions, make some plans. It seems to me that I've got unfinished business in Pakistan.